Iya. Yeah. You first introduce us and then then I can share the screen. Is that a good idea? Yes. Perfect. Yeah. You are on YouTube now. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome um, to this edition, 2022 edition of the um, ENE uh, with the careers um, and environmental affairs. I'm very happy to have uh, our three speakers uh, today, which are very much experienced and enthusiastic um, uh, in working in this area. And I'm looking forward very much for the discussion. Um, we will start um, with uh, Peter Ackerman. Uh, Mr. Ackerman is a um, policy advisor, environmental policy at the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management of the Netherlands since 2019. He received a Bachelor of Arts in International Relations and International Organizations in 2015 and a Master of Arts in International Security from uh, well, in 2017, both from Groningen University. Having started with an internship at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, he continued with a traineeship at the Ministry of Infra Infrastructure and Environment until 2019, when he became policy advisor. Uh, with a focus on new national environmental framework of the Netherlands. Mr. Ackerman also works on setting up an environmental youth council to facilitate youth participation on the environmental policy of the future. So, uh, Mr. Ackerman, well, um, uh, please, you have the floor and we are looking forward. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you for introducing me and uh, hello everyone at home that's uh, tuning in today. Um, I'll try sharing my presentation and then we can start. Um, well, Sandra already introduced myself a little bit. Um, I have a few slides available uh, and also on the first slide uh, it says uh, my email address in case you have any questions about uh, working, for example, for the Dutch government, you can always contact me later. Um, so who I am and what I do, uh, Sandra already explained a little bit, uh, but I'm a policy maker at uh, the, the Ministry of the Infrastructure and Water Management in the Netherlands, it used to be called the Ministry of Infrastructure and Environment. Uh, well, we still do environmental policy, but the name uh, changed. Um, and I'm kind of, I'm passionate about, uh, about making a change in the world. Um, and I think that's the reason why I work at this, this ministry, uh, I'm very concerned about the crisis on climate, biodiversity, environment, all these kind of things. And I want to make uh, make an impact uh, at a place where I really think that uh, that you really have some uh, influence on changing something. So sitting close to the fire. That's why I decided to, to work at the ministry. And that's why I decided to work um, on writing a new national environmental program. Because this program, I think, will have a big influence on the period from now until 2050 to really change society to become greener, more just, and uh, more sustainable for, 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 for our current and future future generations. Um, I'm a person who has lots of ideas. I'm a little bit of an entrepreneurial uh, attitude, and I'm also a little bit of an activist. I really want to, to change some things, uh, which is not always the most uh, standard thing that you will see in government, but more on that later. Uh, like. Like I said before, I'm schooled in diplomacy and uh, in security between states, and especially on, on Russia and Ukraine, so I found that very interesting. But I made the switch to, to say sustainability a few years ago because I thought that that's the biggest challenge of humanity, so it's very important for now to to uh, to take action in that field. Uh, for my background in diplomacy, I do take on that I like to network and to connect with other people, to mobilize uh, society and especially youth. And I'm a little bit of a workaholic because uh, I think that this is a big crisis that we are in right now with, with climate, biodiversity, environment, but also, of course, health and security. So I try to do lots of things to, to, to make a difference. Um, what I do is many different things. First of all, I'm a, I'm a writer of the National Environmental Program. And um, what this entails is that we as a government make a strategy. How should the world look like in 2050 on environment? And this requires us to think about all kinds of different aspects. And we say, like, 
we want that uh, the world in 2050, there's no longer pollution to, uh, to air, to water, to soil, that uh, people no longer have health issues or die from pollution, uh, that ecosystems are healthy, and uh, that our economy is sustainable. That is, on the one hand, that means sustainable finance, means that products are circular and safe by design, um, and that uh, we no longer receive harm from the products that we buy. Um, so that, that's kind of like the work that I do as, 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 as a writer um, in, the, in, the, in the policy field. Next to that, I find it important that we don't just write this policy, but also really uh, connect with the people that are actually part of this transition. Because it's not just the government, but also, uh, of course, industry, uh, consumers, uh, different organizations, and most importantly, also the youth. Um, and as I found uh, in previous uh, policy tracks that I participated in, is that young people are uh, often not enough connected uh, to participate in these big transitions. They often worry a lot about the future, but they are not longer have the, the, the power to really change something in the sense of voting or having like an influential position at, uh, at the workplace. Uh, and therefore I said like, well, for this uh, policy track that we're doing now with the environmental policy, I, um, I want to start an initiative called the uh, Youth Council, where young people uh, can structurally, not just for the picture, but structurally give input on our environmental policy, on our environmental program, uh, so they can can influence their, their future for the better. Uh, that's, that's also the second bullet on the list. Um, and you see in this picture here in the background, this is uh, an uh, event that I organized about 50 years environmental policy in the Netherlands. And you see here uh, older people, those are uh, former and current ministers on environment. And next to them, you see young people. And those are the people from uh, the Environmental Youth Council, uh, and that's the Jonger Milieuraad. And uh, I brought them together on this event, but also, of course, on many other uh, occasions, to, to talk about what issues young people uh, face on environment and how they think uh, the world should look like. Um, but on these events, but also just on a day to day basis, of course, makers, they, they give us uh, their ideas. Um, so that's a second part of, um, of my work. And the third one is organizing of events like, like this one, but also on the 14th of June, we have, uh, for example, an event on uh, 50 years limit to growth report of the Club of Rome, which deals with like a scarcity of resources. So uh, that, that can also be part of, of being a policymaker. But it really depends what you find important. Like you have many policymakers that just write policy and do their job, but I always like to kind of like see like, what triggers me in work and what do I find important and then start a project or an event. And that makes things for me at least a, a lot more interesting. Like for example, the book that those people are holding in the picture is also like a book that I helped writing. Just because they said, we need people to help write a book about 50 years environment. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I'll just join in. And that's, I think, the, one of the cool things of working for the government. Uh, if you have a little bit of a, of a skill for something or like something, you can always find a, a cool task or a cool project to, to join or initiate to, to to make some impact. Um, next to this, I also do an initiative uh, which is part of, of, of education, which you and the government can always do, uh, which is called the Nudge Global Impact Challenge, which means that you try to, to learn with leadership about how to have an impact in society. And we started uh, to build an, an app to, to green cities called Serendicity. Uh, and the last thing that I do outside of my work is that I am head of an NGO uh, called Bos that funds itself is, which is translated like forest that owns itself, which um, is actually like, for me, it's kind of like lots of policy is kind of like very much like writing text and slowly changing the course of where the Netherlands ha is heading. It's very abstract, and, but next to it, I also really like to do something uh, practical. And that's what I kind of do in this, this, this project where we buy a piece of forest, we give it back to nature and attach uh, nature laws, or at least attempt to attach nature laws to it and restore the ecosystem. Uh, more on that later, but it's, um, it, it, I think it's also very interesting for, uh, for, 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 for students like yourself in, in, in environmental law to, to think about how you can influence the world to think differently about certain aspects of law or of, of, of our environment. Um, now, the next slide is about working at, in a ministry. 
Um, this this building is the building where I work. It's it's next to the, the train station in uh, in the Hague, um, and it it actually houses multiple ministries: the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but also my Ministry uh, of Infrastructure and Water Management, and part of the Immigration Nationalization Services. Um, and being a civil servant, I think that it's it's very important to to know it's 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 uh, it's, it's an interesting job, in a sense of that you really think about the bigger picture. You really think about where is the Netherlands heading on a certain topic. It can be about uh, indeed like uh, green mobility, or it can be about uh, environmental law. It can be about aviation, and uh, these these big transitions that we are sitting, for example, with with with, 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 with climate. Um, it, it's just really really interesting to work on, but it's also quite abstract. And that's if you want to work for a ministry like this. Uh, they require you to speak uh, B2 Dutch and have a university degree. So if you have this ambition, then, then those are like the basics. Uh, what you study is not super important as a background in many af aspects. For example, I'm writing uh, environmental policy. Well, I have a background in diplomacy. So uh, that shows that you don't necessarily need to have the background as long as you're good at writing and bringing the right experts together that do have the knowledge. That can either be through uh, or knowledge institutions on the one hand, or by having some indeed like substance matter um, expert colleagues that, that that work with you in in this big building. Um, the work culture in the, the ministries is is nice. Overall, we try to be a very uh, diverse and inclusive group of people. Uh, there's lots of options to have um, have education next to your work to really find a spot that fits you. Especially the traineeship program is is very nice to get into the government because you have like two years where you have four different positions which you can choose where you want to work within the government and have a little education to really find the spot that fits you because it's very important if you start working to do something you like um, and the ministry has of course many many career options as well uh, you can of course have different tracks grow in a certain uh, expert uh, expertise on the one hand or go to to become a generalist or even management so there are multiple options and they really strongly facilitate it with, with lots of education options um, and next to that it's always nice because if you work as a civil servant you have like uh, eight nine weeks of holidays each year which not many other jobs offer so that's that's really good um, and what else well the pay in the ministry is like good but not maybe as good as for example banking or like a real estate or anything like that but it, it's it, it's quite solid uh nothing spectacular but uh, it, it it gets the job done and, and all the the side benefits of having education and having lots of holidays and uh having the opportunities to sometimes travel for your work really make it a, a really valuable i think and very nice experience to work um now uh, a little bit of I really thought about like what can I tell you about uh, the ministry because working in the ministry uh, and then in relation to uh, to of course you as as environmental lawyers or to be at least um, I thought like maybe I can tell you a little bit more also about the NGO that I uh, set up because uh, we are really thinking about shaping uh, different types of law uh, and have influence on 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 how to f on yeah on future lawmaking. Um, in lots of countries in Latin America, there's always already something like rights of nature and uh, also like uh, law in the making on, on ecocide and things like that to protect uh, nature. And um, we try in, in the Netherlands with this initiative to also uh, at some point include rights of nature in, in, in the legal system. It's, it's a long way ahead. That's why all the young people that are involved are already aware that maybe in 20, 30 years we might be successful. But we try with an experiment to give a little bit of forest land back to nature in, a, in an NGO, which in its statute says like the land that owns owned by this organization is owned by, by itself. Then restore the ecosystem and then try via maybe court cases, maybe via in influencing policymakers or a third route to, to, to bring rights of nature to the Netherlands and create awareness uh, so we have an extra gradation of protection for for nature, um, and I think that's important because, as you maybe know, like with environment and and, and with with uh, with nature, the reason why we got into this uh, this this, this well, I, I call it third planetary crisis with three crises on biodiversity, climate, and environment is because we did not protect our living environment enough, 
you know, correct nature enough and kind of like give businesses and, and consuming and production uh, services too much uh, leeway to do whatever they want. And that's uh, what it got us in a lot of trouble. So saying like we have to protect the basis, protect nature, very dependent on for water or air or our crops, everything um, is, is, is the basis for, 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 for a healthy society. Um, then, then the, my last slide already, um, because I told you a little bit about where I work, initiatives on the site, how it is to work in the ministry. Um, and as a young professional, I, I also learned a lot from just working and experiencing different things. And I think it's good to give you some insights into like what is important to know when you start working. And I think the first of all, the most important thing is that you do something that you're actually passionate about. Uh, lots of people decide on a study, think, oh, that's quite cool. And then they find a job and then they're just like happy to have a job. And then they stay in a job for a few years and after a while they get frustrated and maybe for five or 10 years they quit and go do something else. Uh, and that's of course a waste because then you might be on a track on something that you might not like enough and then it's path dependency and before you know you're stuck somewhere and it takes a hard time to kind of like change to a different profession. So first of all, if in your first few years it's very important to kind of like sort out a little bit like what do I like? Where do I get energy from? Do I work to live or do I live to work? And of course it would be great if you like on the one hand like your private time but also really like your job because then, then you get most energy out of it. Because well, one third or one fourth of your life is, is working, so it better should be good. Um, and to find your job, you have to really take, or a job you like, you have to take initiative. That's very important. No one's gonna, uh, the most, the person that's most responsible for finding a cool job is of course you. So you have to kind of like say to your, when you work somewhere like, hey, I like to do this or that. I'm good at this or that. And then hold up your hand whenever something comes by that, that you find most interesting. So you get maybe interesting tasks or sometimes time take initiative to switch to something better. Uh, and that's really important. It's, it's it's maybe scary, especially if you just start working, then you might be just happy to have a job. But in the long run, it, it, I think it will really pay off. Um, then another thing that I see a lot with people that just start working with us is that they um, that they sit at lots of different meetings, but they don't really dare saying something because they think it's not allowed or whatever. Uh, and especially in Dutch culture, if you sit at the table, you're expected to take part in the conversation because we are equal with all the other people at the table. Um, so take that. So if you have uh, have an opinion on something and you sit at the discussion, take part, and you will learn to 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 give an opinion and to contribute. And that's that's like a really important skill throughout your life. Um, then the next thing is also that you should take responsibility for for yourself. Um, lots of young people I see they have uh, they get burnouts because they work too hard. Um, because they don't really know what is the boundary, what is expected. And then they sometimes say to their boss, like, yeah, I work too hard. And then they say, well, good luck. You work too hard, but uh, you have to figure it out yourself what to do. Uh, and, then, and then you kind of get a little bit stuck and keep working harder and harder. So uh, important to realize is uh, you are responsible for your life and for the amount of work that you do. Uh, and if it's too much, you have to say, no, it's too much. And then you have to, most of the time, especially in this culture, have to arrange yourself how do you get less work? And that's of course a little bit tricky. So uh, it's, it's good to invest in that. And if it doesn't work out, ask a coach. I really like talk multiple times with your boss just to really say like, hey, this is enough or I want to do something else um, because no one else is going to do that for you. Uh, another thing that is I think also very important is that I see lots of young people do is that they take lots of different tasks on them and they kind of like think that they will do best by doing Lots of that they can to deliver lots of different uh, projects or like uh, assignments. But what I see lots of older colleagues do, and that's very smart, they do a few things, but they do them really well. So instead of like, because no one will remember those mediocre projects that you did, even if you did 10 at a time, they all think, like, oh, well, whatever. But people will remember those really well projects that went really well and were really like amazing and impressive. So if you can, try to do a few good projects, run them really well, and it will be easier to uh, get a career started and doing a lot of different things, which uh, often happens. Um, also, don't sexually overwork. I, many of my colleagues do that when they are young. Uh, it's not a good thing. Uh, no one should overwork. Uh, it's of course hard, but especially in this this part of life, especially in these times, uh, put boundaries and say, okay, well, I overworked an hour today. That's more than enough. And if it's structure, you think that, that you don't have enough time to do things, then you should really talk to your bosses about it and, and put boundaries. It's, it's a hard thing, but very important. 
Uh, another thing is taking interest in your colleagues. I misspelled colleagues, sorry for that. Uh, and explore their motivations because it's important to know like what, how can my, can my colleagues help me? Do they have like any interest that I can learn from? And what are their uh, motivations? Especially also with your boss, like what is what, what does your boss want out of the job and what does your boss want from you? And often they are very vague on what they want from you. So it's, it's good to kind of like continue asking like, and what exactly do you want from me in this assignment? Or what exactly do you want me to do in this, in my role in my team? So really, really be critical about it. And if you think it doesn't feel right, it's probably not right. So you should, should ask about it. And that's the last one. There are no stupid questions. Lots of I I help lots of interns now to to get a start in uh, in our ministry. It's a lot of fun, but they're always hesitant to ask things because they think, well, if I ask this, it's stupid. But that's not really the case. Um, every question is good. So if you're wondering about something, just ask, and probably someone else would have wondered the same thing. So so no worries. Oh, and I see I also missed the bullet point, and that's girls don't know what they are doing most of the time, which is also a thing. That uh, it's maybe a little bit funny, meant, but uh, what I notice a lot is um, that even if bosses ask me something to do a certain task, they're like, do something like this and this. And then I'm going to think really hard what my boss wants me to deliver. But most of the time, they don't really know what they want. Uh, and they're also just searching. So, um, and, and especially if you do a, a certain project for lots of older people, it's also new. To do a project so everyone is searching for something and, and older people are often better at like pretending to know a lot about something while they don't know a lot about it uh, and that's also a skill for them uh, but but don't be afraid to kind of like think well maybe i don't know what to do and i'm not stupid no it's just because most of the people don't really know what exactly is going on and then just last point don't be afraid and ask and that's how i hope that you can uh, can get better at, at your job uh, have an enjoyable uh, work experience and in the end find something hopefully that, that you're passionate about. Um, now those are the slides from my side. Um, I hope actually that there's any questions. But Thank you very much Peter. We'll a very inspiring um, um, a talk and um, uh, one of the points that you have just uh, 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 raised during the presentation when you you presented um, the initiative with the NGO that you created, it reminded me uh, when you mentioned that the forest that owns um, it, it um, uh, something that we discussed with the students in the course is exactly the uh, proposal from um, Stone, which was in the 70s uh, asking whether should trees have have standing. And yes. the whole discussion, right? That's that is uh, really remind me of of that, uh, of this discussion of giving voice. And of course, we have since then we have developed in different ways of how we give voice to nature. Um, but there, really, uh, when I was looking uh, um, at, at your initiative, this really uh, brought me uh, the whole this whole concept, the you know of, of trees having standing all discussion that started in the early seventies and uh, and still now we 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 struggle actually on how to give voice to nature, right? On, on how to, to then guarantee these rights. So um, it's very inspiring to see initiatives like that. Um, thank you for share, uh, uh, sharing this with us. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope the students also um, will have this uh, connection and participate as well. Um, there yeah. are also other um, uh, 13 people watching um, on YouTube and they can, um, of course, also propose questions there and, 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 and Mr. Lohan is taking care of this. But I don't know if in the room, the ones that are in the room would like to address some questions or even um, the other speakers feel free. I mean, it's a conversation uh, to ask or discuss something. Otherwise, I do have more questions, <laughs> but I don't want to <laughs> monopolize. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Everyone, I will continue because then, Peter, I don't see anything in the chat now. So yeah. I will. Um, I also saw the, when I was uh, I've seen the information about about you, and then you can correct me because I saw this on LinkedIn. I saw that you have been a volunteer also with the Hevolde uh, Waterkrauk at part of my Dutch uh, for already the <laughs> twelve years and. Um, and how do you see the impact of voluntary work um, on your career path? 
did you think that um, this uh, um, kind of voluntary work had um, a weight on your decision? Um, on yeah, because you, as you said, you are very act proactive. It will create very um, um, new or, um, opportunities for yourself uh, based on what you believe. And then you made a remark that I, I find interesting that said, oh, that's not always what you see in the government, um, but you indeed work for the government. So how um, it, uh, you balanced this and you made your decision for, um, like, I do want to work off, uh, for the government, but I still will create my yeah, my own initiative so that I can do what I love. Well, that's 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 a really good question. I think uh, to ask to answer the first part of your question is, of course, uh, doing voluntary work is is very good for for uh, for of course doing something good in the world, and it will also of course help you get uh, to pimp your CV so you can get easily into different kinds of jobs. But um, most of the voluntary work, I mean, I'm enrolled in. Is most of those work is you see like lots of people do it when they're like 50, 60, 70 because they can then finally have time to do it. Uh, and that's also a problem with most of the people I talk to. It's kind of like, we would love to have more young volunteers with our project for like longer than just half a year or, uh, or around a semester or something. But it's really hard because uh, volunteering takes a lot of time and often it's not paid very well. And that's why I kind of find a balance. On the one hand, I do just my, my nine to five job which I do with lots of, uh, with lots of enjoyment. It, it's, I really like it. Uh, but at the same time, I find it important to have, lot, to have, to have a volunteering experience to kind of like do something that, 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 that inspires you. And this, this, this water project in Africa, the Gevulde Waterkraak, is, is like one of those yeah, initiatives where we build uh, water containers uh, near houses. Um, and when in the rainy season, they can collect the water and store it in a, in a, in a, in a concrete container. And then if you close it off in the dark, all the bacteria in the water get killed and then it becomes very good to drink. And then in the period where it's the dry season and where sometimes the wells are even drying up, they can have this, this water. And then it has lots of impact on, 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 local, um, on the local society. Girls don't have to walk 10 kilometers to get water, but instead have time to go to school. Less children die uh, in the first years. So if child mortality dies, uh, drops, then less children are being taken so uh, uh, population growth maybe uh, is limited and in another uh, village there was even that they said like well um, we have uh, we always think that that if in a certain part of the year people die because of bad water quality often is that's cholera they think it's a curse and then they go find uh, someone who is responsible for that curse and often like innocent people get killed but the society changed after they got these water systems because uh, they got then all of a sudden good water quality and no one died anymore of this so-called curse called cholera and, and then uh, no no innocent people got, uh, got got prosecuted so it has lots of different spin-off effects and that just gives um, a really good feeling that you can say with a very simple initiative you can help a lot of people to uh, to have a better standard of living and then in that way practically also of course contribute to bigger issues as, 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 as climate change or, or or pollution because you're helping with, with, with the basics of, 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 of um, yeah, survival, so to say. Does this answer your question? I think it's a little bit of a long-winded uh, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, um, I do. Um, uh, I will go for the question that we are receiving from the um, YouTube. Um, so, Mr. Um, Ackerman, um, do you see a difference between how young versus senior policymakers think in terms of the future of the planet? Oh, that's a really good question. Well, uh, what I see is, um, of course, young and old people, in some regards, they think the same, in some regards, they think differently. Uh, how do you think? I think lots of young people that go and work with us, and I try to encourage those people to join the government to be a little bit more activist. It's the people that really are really worried about where the planet is going. They really think, like, well, in the next five or 10 years, we really have to make a change, otherwise, it's too late. And they really feel the urgency in everything they do. Um, and with the older generation, um, some of them also have felt that urgency when they were younger, but they sometimes they forgot a little bit about that. So they are, can be re-inspired by the young people to kind of also be like, yeah, we really have to do something. Uh, well, some other people of the older generation are like, well, yeah, 50 years ago, it was also urgent and still uh, nothing really changed super badly. So no worries, it will probably be fine. So there's a little bit of... Um, a difference to the feeling of urgency is uh, stronger with young people 
and some old people have it and some old people have, have forgot it or you need to kind of like rekindle that fire and yes i think i Very think that's good. the case another question um, also coming from our students um uh, from youtube is that um um hi um, um yeah mr ackerman um uh, i want to know how are conflicts between uh, uh, competing goals of different ministries are reconciled mm -hmm. with environmental ones Oh, that's a really good question as well because we have that a lot that there are like different goals like for example on the one hand we have the, we have to build a mil one million more houses in the netherlands on the other hand that's of course not very good for the environment and where they want to build them is often also not the best place to build houses because of um, water ecosystems and uh, sometimes the ground is not very suitable so that that's 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 a big issue uh, and that requires policymakers to make big decisions. Similarly, for example, with the energy transition, that for uh, for climate and energy transition is maybe very good to burn biomass, but for air quality, which is like typically an environmental topic, it's not very good. So that's just kind of like it requires policymakers and politicians in the end to make decisions. And um, with our environmental program that we are making, we are kind of like flagging all these issues. Like, where do these policies clash? Um, and then we kind of show the trade-offs, and in the end, we ask, uh, yeah, ask the politicians to make a decision. Uh, and you see that some politicians are like very brave, and they can make the decision. And other politicians are kind of like, oh, I don't know. Uh, I'll just sit out my four years, and I'll let the next one uh, decide in four years' time. So uh, it it really depends on, on on the strength of the politician to see, see if they can dare to make a decision, because the decision is always better than just kind of like muddling through like what often also happens. Thank you very much. Um, I do not see um, any questions uh, from the, uh, yeah, not here as well. So I would say that um, uh, we move to the next uh, um, speaker. I do have more questions, uh, Peter, uh, but then um, we, I think we can have a nice discussion uh, by the end with all the speakers if we still have time. Oh, Thank you very good. much for this um, um, inspiring um, uh, talk and for the honest uh, and answers. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. So, so um, Mrs. Um, Nunes um, or Mrs. Uh, um, Hadkova would like to, to present now. Should I just... Uh, I can present. Uh, yep, whomever. <laughs> yes, okay. Please let me introduce um, then uh, Mrs. Hadkova. Um, Ms. Hadkova has been a climate and energy advisor uh, and campaigner at Greenpeace Nordic uh, since um, March of this year. Uh, um, she graduated from, from our university program in uh, 2020 and completed her um, LLM degree in public international law from the University of Oslo just now um, this year as well in January. Uh, previously, Mrs. Hadikov worked as a legal intern at the Eurojust and has worked on a research project at the University of Oslo, a, a project uh, a transatlantic, between transatlantic university collaboration in climate change and energy law between the University of Copenhagen, the University of Denver, and the University of Oslo, funded by the Erasmus Plus. During her time at the University of Oslo, she was an active um, student and was committee chair in refugee and humanitarian law at the International Commission of Jurists Student Chapter. Most recently, she was also a co-coach at the Baltic Environmental Mood Court project. Please, uh, Ms. Hadikov, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction uh, and for inviting me today. You guys can hear me well? Yeah? Yes. Good. Uh, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, You can see my PowerPoint now? Yes, great. We can see. Um, yeah, so um, as you mentioned, Dr. Nabrega, I just started working at Greenpeace um, at the end of March of this year. 
So I've been here just about under two months. Um, so what I'll be presenting to you uh, will be mostly sort of my impressions um, for the last two months, <laughs> because that is all I can I can share at this point, as well as my sort of experience getting here, um, as I am sort of a lot more close to a lot of the students probably watching in terms of experience and paths and timing, et cetera. I think it's it's important to also take you through the sort of my my background a bit more and how I how I ended up here. So as you already said, I'll just quickly I'll go through my sort of background. Um, I finished the international and European law LLB in 2020 and was a legal intern at just between 2018 and 2019. Uh, my LLB thesis was um, titled How the Adoption of the Orbs Convention Advanced the Legal Standing of NGOs When Exercising the Right of Access to Justice, granted to them by Article 9.3. So already then I was quite um, focused on the role of NGOs uh, within environmental law and here more specifically procedural environmental law. Uh, I did my LLM in public international law at the University of Oslo, handed in my master thesis in December of last year and graduated very recently. Um, and my thesis here uh, was on uh, the role of the Paris Agreement in domestic climate change litigation. Um, and as you stated, I have recently been a coach for the Baltic Environmental Mood Court, which was a a moot court for students in high school age where they went through a climate change case at the ECHR or um, simulation. Uh, and currently, as I stated, I'm an advisor and campaigner at Greenpeace and here in Norway and in the Oslo office. Um, so how did I end up here? Um, I started gaining an interest in environmental uh, and climate change law around my second year at the Hague University. Um, and then that was sort of coupled with interest in the role of civil society and NGOs, and as well as their access to justice. Um, and I was always very um, intrigued by how sort of uh, environmental rights and policies can be enforced re legally and sort of looking for those pathways. Um, I was very interested in doing my master's here in Oslo because Dr. Professor Christina Voigt is one of the leading academics in the field of international environmental law and climate change litiga litigation and was also a co-negotiator for Norway during the Paris Agreement negotiations. And that just seemed like the right place for me, for me to sort of uh, be, have her as a professor and eventually as a thesis supervisor, which is why I decided to um, apply for a master's here. However, not everything goes as planned, and I think this is also an important lesson. Uh, actually, I was not admitted at first, um, upon which I decided to complain uh, and was then um, offered a place. So, um, yeah, it worked out in the end. This was on Monday, <laughs> so uh, a bit of a delayed graduation. So, um, yeah. Uh, as I stated, um, my thesis was on the role of the Paris Agreement and domestic climate change litigation. Um, and I sort of closely try to look at different NGOs and judges' arguments when it comes to climate change litigation um, on a domestic level for the most part. Um, and as you can see, this sort of interest has been something that I've had since my bachelor's, um, the role of NGOs of civil society. Um, and when I graduated, I started looking for work within that field. Um, so technically my dream job uh, as I was finishing was to work um, within an, an, an NGO with sort of advising legally on, on um, yeah, whether it is climate change litigation or sort of legal pathways in other ways as well. Um, and I knew that Greenpeace has had a, a climate suit going on since 2016 um, called the People versus Arctic Oil. And um, I knew that 
as I was, the Supreme Court judgment came out during my LLM studies, um, I became even more interested in it. Um, I did not analyze it for my thesis uh, as it, we lost, <laughs> and I was looking more so at the some cases that had been ruled in favor of the environmental um, movement. But um, it was certainly uh, of big interest to me that there was an NGO out here that um, was um, approaching climate litigation in this way. Um, and now this case is being taken to the European Court of Human Rights, and that I knew also while I was looking for work, uh, which was in the beginning of this year of 2022. Um, so it seemed like sort of the perfect place for me to go into um, and work. Um, and I think it's important that I take you through a bit of my experience with uh, job search as it was, I had just, I've just recently gone through it uh, a couple of months ago. Um, I think, you know, you can sort of, a lot of us doubt ourselves a lot. So that was the case with me as well. Um, I think it's normal when we are young professionals or have just graduated to sort of feel a bit lost and not know what we're doing. Um, be quite overwhelmed by the whole process. Um, so I was a bit skeptical and found that I had to get out of my own way a lot and have a, a lot more of a positive outlook. Uh, I think part of the reason for that was because when I had graduated from HHS, I, um, I um, actually looked for work here in Oslo for some months during the summer, but I was unsuccessful in finding that. And I think that left bit of a negative experience when it came to the job market here. Uh, but I had to sort of change my mindset and realize that this is now different circumstances. I have more experience. I have another degree. Um, and yeah, I think also because we don't have a very traditional legal education, we're a lot more internationally focused. Um, yeah, I thought that that would be a hinder, but I think it's important to use it more as an advantage and look at it in a different way. Because while we don't have a traditional legal education, it is unique and not many people have it. And I think it's important to look at it from that perspective when you're writing applications and stuff. So um, how to look for work, obviously have your notifications on for postings in your areas of interest. And I actually not only had it within environmental law, but also different areas that I also found interesting. Um, I think it's important to know we say this all the time and our professors tell us, but to network, get to know key individuals within the field, use LinkedIn, be proactive, like send emails, make phone calls, ask questions, ask for the opportunities that you want to have. Um, people like that more proactive attitude. And I know this is something they tell us all the time and I hated to hear it as well, but I think it is important. Um, and know that many rejections will come, but it only takes one opportunity. So that's how you need to look at it because, you know, won't be everyone's cup of tea. <laughs> uh, I think it's important to tailor each application to the work. Um, I found this job just through a notification um, on our website here, which is called FIN, um, where a lot of job postings uh, can be found. Uh, so it was quite a traditional process for me um, to get this work. Um, but I knew that it was, uh, when I saw that the posting, I was like, oh, this is exactly what I what I've been wanting to get involved with. Um, so I knew that I, I really wanted this. I really tailored my application. I knew I could do a good job. So I had that mindset and I was really positive. I wasn't skeptical when it came to this job because it was something that I was really passionate about and I knew I could do really well. Um, so here they wanted me to start as soon as possible and that was written in the application. And I think it's important to be flexible if you're able to. Um, I sent it right away when I saw it. I did not wait for a deadline to go out and I was actually called before the deadline went out. So I think it's it's very important to just, when you see something, try and, and send an application as soon as possible. Uh, and then I had a first interview and the second one. Uh, thankfully I was called back. Uh, the first was very traditional. Uh, the second interview was a bit more um, stressful and 
thorough with like training um, with a practice run of like an interview, like an actual like interview with the media, uh, making a statement and doing little tasks like that, that I, you're like not prepared for. <laughs> so just try and if you, if you end up in that situation, just know that you're capable. But of course, those types of situations are always a bit stressful, but that is, you know, nerves are very normal. Um, so just taking a bit, uh, you a bit more through what we do here. Um, I think a lot of people think of Greenpeace and imagine these images that we see here, people chaining themselves to ships or climbing platforms, oil platforms, or painting something. Um, and I think it's important to know, and also something that I, I was surprised by when I was researching um, the organization, um, is this pyramid where um, we always try to do sort of the right thing first. We do our research, our investigation, uh, we put political pressure, we look for legal um, uh, resolutions, peaceful resolutions with those that we're trying to sort of, with the, with the goals that we're trying to reach. Um, if that is not successful, we'll, we'll follow up. Um, we'll try and um, schedule meetings with politicians. Um, as you know, we've had, as I said, uh, the climate litigation case. Um, so those are sort of the first steps that we take. And, you know, civil disobedience is, um, as you can see, uh, depicted in a lot of these pictures here. Um, and that is sort of the last resort for us. So I think a lot of people, because it's, it's, it is what catches media attention. It's like Greenpeace did this and Greenpeace did this, but it's, you know, you don't see all the work that goes behind the scenes for us to sort of reach that point where we, we feel like we haven't been listened to in any other way, or we're not taken seriously uh, with our goals. Um, and that is when we resort to that. But um, I received uh, some training on this. <laughs> Um, but um, yeah, it's still a very interesting work, and I, I was actually really interested in, in Greenpeace because of the many different uh, tools used to sort of get our, our points across and reach our goal and yeah, work towards um, or against the climate crisis at this point. So this is, uh, as you know, Greenpeace is a very international organization. Uh, there are 24 seven offices around the world in 55 different countries uh, and have been in Norway since 1988. Uh, the main headquarter office is in Amsterdam. Um, so if that is um, sort of what Greenpeace International is. Um, and we're, uh, we have a lot of different offices around the world. Uh, in our office here, we're about 30 people. Um, so what do I do? Uh, my main tasks and responsibilities. Um, so my official title in English is a, a campaigner. My title in Norwegian is a advisor. <laughs> so um, what that entails is a lot of planning and strategy um, for campaigns. So that is like whether we're trying to push for uh, an ocean treaty or whether we're trying to, um, you know, take the state uh, through the court system. Um, we're trying to stop uh, the opening of a new oil um, platform. Those are sort of different campaigns that we have, whether we work with the Amazon, those are different campaigns. And we have about four or five campaigners here in the office where each of us have different tasks and are responsible for different campaigns. Um, so I do some of that um, or have you know, started doubling in, in that a bit. Um, uh, I give on um, some occasions legal advice uh, and other advice as well. We're quite active on social media. So we talk a lot about how do we present ourselves there? How do we uh, present ourselves in traditional media as well? Um, and we also do a lot of lobbying um, with uh, politicians and put, try and put political pressure as well as commercial pressure on companies to attain the goals that we have. Uh, I work a lot with sort of how do we take those complicated reports like the IPCC reports and 
make them digestible for the general public. What is the main things that we need to pull out from these um, to make them, you know, easy to understand. Um, a lot of research and investigation on on different sort of um, what is different companies, um, politicians. Uh, again, the like environmental reports. Um, we have to be able to speak to the media and be sort of representatives of the organization. Um, you know, things happen all the time and we have to be ready to have comments um, on, on different matters all the time. And another uh, aspect of my work is activism. Um, so as I said, I've had some civil disobedience training, but yes, that is whether it's we have a demonstration, uh, whether it's, you know, a, an active action, which is planned out, um, that is also part of, of what we do here. So as you can see, a lot of varied <laughs> types of responsibilities, which makes the work really interesting. Um, and new things are happening all the time and I am just sort of have to be <laughs> on. <laughs> so that is quite exciting. Um, and my three main sort of projects or campaigns since starting uh, have been an issue with um, clean drinking water in Bergen here in Norway, uh, a campaign called Oil Fuels War, which relates to the war in Ukraine, and then the People versus Arctic uh, Oil case, which we're now taking to the European Court. So I'll take you briefly through the three of them, and that is, as I said, what I've been working on the most in the last two months, so it's still very fresh. <laughs> um, so my second day uh, here, uh, I was told that I'm going to have meetings at Parliament with some politicians and as well as the one of the advisors of the Minister for Transportation. Um, and the reason for that was because uh, residents close to the airport in Belgium had contacted us and sought assistance because they for over 10 years have had dangerous PSAs in, in their water, drinking water, so they haven't been able to have drinking water. And that is a res as a result of fire drills uh, at the airport like years ago. And that is actually not a usual case that Greenpeace takes on because we're more sort of internationally um, focused or like more big picture, big policy. Um, but these people were really pleading with us and wanted us to help them give them uh, a platform here. And, you know, because we have connections with, with people in parliament and we have good relations with some of them. We thought it was important to help, or I was told this was my second day that it's important to help um, with this. So we had, yeah, we organized meetings with the parliament, um, and yeah, it was very nerve wracking, very scary second day, but it was, it went okay. <laughs> so um, what sort of the goal with this was to put political pressure for the ministry to take action because the airport company is government owned and clean up uh, and connect them to clean drinking water. You know, it's, you don't expect people in Norway in 2022 to not have clean drinking water. Uh, you know, that shouldn't be the case anywhere. Uh, so part of what I did with that, as well as accompanying them to those meetings, the people from the, the residents uh, and sort of giving them a voice. Also, I gave some advice on legal grounds they could use for appeal of an insufficient environmental impact assessment which was made uh, in relation to this and also how to seek compensation when it came to that so that was sort of my first task here <laughs> and it was really interesting and then actually my interview my first interview was on the 24th of february so it happened the day that the war started so my work has been largely focused on uh, our oil fuels war campaign which started uh, with an investigation into Norwegian tankers, which we found were transporting Russian oil. So we started investigating through marine traffic, which is a database that shows all different ship movements. Um, some of these companies had made claims that they do moral shipping, that they had not uh, done any business with, with Russian oil companies. Um, and largely what we did with this campaign was um, we tried to put pressure on the companies to sort of stop um, uh, having business with Russian oil companies because 
Russian uh, oil and gas is Putin's number one sort of um, uh, income resource. Um, so it was basically indirectly fueling the war, or it still is. Um, so more practically, what we did with that was send out letters um, to the different companies. We sent out letters to the government itself and different officials within the government to sort of demand from them that there is some action being taken on this. Um, we, we did not receive any replies. We received some replies from the companies, but they put the, um, the responsibility on the government. So it was a bunch of back and forth. Um, as you know now, there's talks about an oil embargo on a European level. Uh, that was not the case back then, and we still believe that as Norway is not, uh, does not have the same dependency on Russian oil as the rest of Europe does, that this should be something that's just not happening uh, that's at, at this time, that Norway cannot, you know, feed into Putin's war machine, so to speak. <laughs> So we've been um, working quite a bit on that. And then we found that the Norwegian company, uh, Exxon subsidiary here was actually actively buying Russian oil and it was being imported into Norway. Um, and because we haven't received any uh, re uh, replies from the government, from any of the officials, from the prime minister, from the external affairs minister, our last resort was to take action against the ship, which was transporting this. So this is some of my colleagues, which had chained themselves to the anchor chain of a huge oil tanker, which was transporting Russian oil into Norway. And this is a double page spread in the Guardian from the day after. So we received a lot of international media attention with this uh, in the Washington Post, uh, in different, a lot of different media all over the world. And that was really interesting for me to see. This was a month into me being here, uh, my first action. Uh, I did not participate, I was not on the boats, but I was sort of on land trying to coordinate things. Um, and that was really interesting. So that's one of the ways that we sort of do things here, if no other ways are um, uh, working. So, and then what I'm doing, um, or like focusing most on right now is the climate case, um, which is also super relevant when it comes to my background and my interest. Uh, so as I stated, the climate case was initiated against the state of Norway by Greenpeace and HRN Youth uh, in 2016. And the main issue was that arguing that hanging, handing out new oil licenses in the Barents Sea, uh, which is the Arctic basically, violates Article 112 of the Norwegian Constitution. And that is the right to, or that assures the right to a healthy and livable environment for every citizen in Norway. Uh, so Greenpeace and Nature News lost at all three domestic instances. Um, so now we're taking the case to the European Court of Human Rights on the basis of articles two and eight. So the right to life and the right to private and family life. Um, so that's one of the, you know, first climate change uh, or environmental cases that are being taken, um, and not environmental, but climate, that are being taken to the European Court of Human Rights. So it's a very interesting time. And what I am currently doing is working with our lawyers, which are external, uh, and Greenpeace International in Amsterdam, which has a legal unit on uh, creating legal arguments um, that we're going to be communicating to the court and they're on the basis of the state's response uh, to the court that they have previously issued to them. So that is sort of my main work at this moment and it's very exciting to sort of be really putting the theoretical uh, knowledge that I have into practice quite literally um, on, on a topic which was so close to sort of what I focused in what I have focused on during my education. Um, so yeah, that is super exciting at the moment. And here's just my last two months, very varied <laughs> um, tasks. We did, um, we collaborated on a demonstration with the Ukrainian association here um, to sort of put, um, put forward our petition on boycotting Russian oil. Uh, 
next to that is a picture with a member of parliament that I had. That was my second day. I had a meeting with her. Um, some other demonstrations, uh, workers on the 1st of May, uh, Labor Day, and then the ship and the small kayaks next to it that we tried to block. We managed to block it for six hours <laughs> before the police took my colleagues away. Um, so yeah, that is briefly uh, what I've been doing for the last two months. Um, I am, you know, still learning, as Peter said, you know, trying to get my thoughts out there. Um, but yeah, really enjoying my work. And you have my email here, my LinkedIn, if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Clementina. Um, what exciting two months you have had. Uh, uh, congratulations on all your achievements. And um, thank you very much for bringing this uh, all to us today. Uh, amazing to see um, how um, uh, the, all this knowledge that you had uh, gained in, in your uh, years uh, and bachelor and master has come together now uh, at uh, at your current position. So it's very, I think it's good that you mentioned, Francis, the topics of your um, bachelor uh, thesis and, and, and master thesis. So for our, our students, um, especially the ones that I hear from the module that we have on environmental law, we do um, have exactly these topics that we discuss, access to justice. Um, so in the context of procedural rights with the Aarhus Convention, this is, uh, uh, we have one week uh, discussing this. It's so interesting to see um, that you have picked this, that you are now using all this in your career. So it's good for the students to see how you build up also in view of this now you um, you see us have to have this very practical uh, perspective um on on when they write the the what is uh, what is used to be the bachelor thesis and we see for instance for you you have um, worked with the uh, non governmental organization standing and it connects also very much with what we just this mentioned uh, with Peter um, about giving voice to the environment. So who takes these roles? And that is a large discussion on whether the energy NGOs, like environmental NGOs, could respond to that. Um, so that's all connected very well. And um, it's, it's so beautiful to see this all linkage and 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 how what we um, study in, in class actually is so relevant in, in, in real life. So thank you um, um, uh, for that. It's, uh, it's really, really um, interesting. and. Um, yeah, to see and make these connections. I do have already a question for you from um, um, yeah from the chat from one of our students that are watching on on YouTube. And the question, um, well, first as a remark, thank you for this really interesting presentation. And uh, I would love to work for an organization like Greenpeace. Uh, on a more technical question, how um, do you see this lawsuit against the Norwegian states? developing at the EC um, HR, so the court. Uh, and will you help uh, with the case going forward? Um, well, it's nice to see that you would love to work at Greenpeace. <laughs> I think it's a very interesting experience and um, yeah, it's a very nice organization to work at. Lovely people, very good conditions. So. Um, yeah, I will see. It's very hard to tell uh, because it's one of the first sort of climate change cases or ruling that will be made on the basis of sort of oil, the oil industry and uh, how the sort of ways in which it is problematic when it comes to uh, the global climate. Um, the thing with the Norwegian system is that um, it is quite literal in its um, interpretation of the law, um, of the rights within the Constitution. Um, and their main argument was that um, because at a licensing stage, you're not yet in, it's not, you're not as far as the production stage um, when it comes to oil exploration and production. Um, there is no, the right to a healthy, livable environment is not breached because it has not yet happened, the production. And thus, in this case, there was a big question about exported emissions as well. 
So the, the, the court was very literal in its interpretation saying because it's only licensing at this point. It's not anything that matters when it comes to that right because, you know, it doesn't mean that if we license uh, these fields, then that they will end up yielding production from them. So well, that is quite very textual, um, narrow interpretation of, of, of the law and of the rights human rights, especially those found in the Constitution. Um, my hope for the European Court is that they're a bit more principal, and this is, we're talking about a very big topic here, um, about making a stance on fossil fuels um, and how that negatively impacts human rights and also disproportionately impacts human rights in, in, in many ways. Um, the court has um, sort of um, labeled this case uh, impact case. So it means that it could have quite significant um, consequences when it comes to sort of um, jurisprudence in general before the European court. Um, so it could be very significant, their finding, uh, whether it goes one way or the other. Um, but, you know, I think um, the court uh, interprets, so the European court interprets things in a lot more sort of um, systemic way and in ways where our rights granted from the convention are more practical and that they're, they're, you can see the clear link. Why else do you need to license, you know, oil fields if you don't plan on producing from them, you know? So those are my hopes um, for the court. Uh, I'm not sure how exactly it will go. Uh, they have recently admitted uh, the climate case from Switzerland, the Klima Signorina case. Um, uh, that will be actually heard at the Grand Chamber there, but we'll see whether the same happens with our case or it will be only like a written uh, judgment. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited and I will be following the process as long as um, it takes, as long as I'm here, I'm on a one year contract at this moment, but um, because we get all our funding from our donors, we don't accept any state um, support. Um, our budget is quite strict for each year, so um, we'll see if I will be able to stay on longer, but um, um, I will be following this as long as, as I'm here um, and I'm very excited. So now our next step is to file our reply to the state's reply, uh, and then we'll see if the court sort of decides to what it what it decides to do. It's quite hard to say at this at this moment. Um, thank you very much, Clementina. Just um, um, building up on that, a follow up question. Um, because you just mentioned um, the students are very much interested how you engage, so how you contribute to that. And you said I work with the so a national lawyer, but also with um, um, uh, the legal department of uh, Greenpeace International, right? And uh, in this case, you also okay, you work and and on this case that you mentioned, but uh, the actions so of civil disobedience, for instance, there is also a risk assessment, I believe, and. Um, um, are you involved on that as well? On those types of actions or like, yeah. On this risk assessment yeah, from the legal perspective, because I know that they will uh, assess on whether, well, yeah. in, in each uh, of these actions, what are the possible consequences, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, maybe then, um, of course, you also maybe discuss this with your, your colleagues um, on how it works. I know that is the beginning, but if you have an idea how this will um, develop. Yeah, so we have a very sort of um, strict, not strict, but the legal sort of ramifications around those types of actions are for the most, most part quite clear and they have sort of been set by lawyers working within this specific field. Um, sort of the crime for the most part will be not following police orders. So that is sort of a, most of the time the extent to which it goes, which, you know, then ends up in being a fine for the individual, which is then paid by Greenpeace as an organization. So, but there is a, a, a risk that you take yourself 
when you decide to partake uh, in an action and you can pull out at any time and that is very important uh, for us to serve underline and has been underlined to me many times um, so but you know, after the fact, um, my colleagues had to, you know, have meetings with the police um, or like, yeah, interrogations, so to speak. So I have been sort of consulted on what would be sort of the best thing to say or plans like that. So, yes, in some case, cases, I can I can be involved in that way. Or if I were to partake in an action in the future, uh, it's, of course, good to have that legal background, I think. Um, but yeah, it's um, it is it is risky, but it's it is one of our core values is sort of individual responsibility. Although you know Greenpeace covers as much as is possible in terms of monetary consequences and legal fees, etc., if that is needed. Um, but yeah, there is definitely a risk that each person has to assess. And I am sort of the only person with a legal background in our office, so. Where I can help with that, of course, I, I, I do. Yes, thank you very much. I would then, um, in view of the time, I would move uh, to our last speaker, and then I would go back so that I open the floor to the questions that we have. Again, Peter has to answer one, and the others that will come, so that we have a final then round of, of questions. I will introduce our last, so thank you very much, uh, Clementine, and I will come back uh, shortly. Uh, and I will introduce then our last speaker for tonight. It's sorry, right tonight, right? Uh, that is uh, uh, Cynthia Nunes. Um, Mrs. Nunes is a project manager, climate change and digital learning at Hamburg University of Applied Science. Mrs. Nunes received a bachelor a uh, degree from the University, um, the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte in Brazil, where I met um, um, Cynthia when we were uh, still graduate students at the time. Um, and, uh, uh, and a degree and a uh, master degree in law and economics at the University of Hamburg and arrived University with one semester spent in the University of Bologna. We do have an Italian colleague also uh, in the room, um, <laughs> Christina. Um, after several uh, positions in Brazil, such as legal counsel at the State Court of Audit um, uh, in Natal, Brazil, Mrs. Nunes has been in turn and temporary assistant at the International Tribunal uh, for the Law of the Sea in Hamburg, consultant at the International Seabed Authority and part of the legal team at um, EU, at, uh, at the legal team at Free Now. So, Mrs. Nunes, um, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and please have the floor. Thank you for the introduction. Yes, as uh, Dr. Nobrega said, uh, we met uh, in our hometown and we were students at the same university uh, doing our bachelor's at the same time. And it's funny that we actually met because we were working on the same project that was about environmental law and popular education. So it's, I think it's very special that now I'm talking about uh, yeah, careers in environmental affairs and yeah, our background in environmental law. So yeah, it's, uh, it's funny how, how we meet people again and again uh, yeah, in different situations. Okay, so... Um, First, I think it's important that I tell you what I do because uh, uh, being a project manager is maybe not an obvious choice for people who studied law. So here at the university in Hamburg, we have six universities in Hamburg, six public universities. So I'm in the University of Applied Sciences and I am in the Research and Transfer Center of Sustainability and Climate Change Management. Um, this center has existed for about 30 years. It was created by uh, the professor who's still today. He's my boss. And um, the goal, as you can see from the name, is just not only to research those topics of sustainability and climate change management, but also to transfer this knowledge into society. And in this sense, we, we 
take care of transferring not only here in Hamburg in Germany, but uh, all across the world. So uh, we have we have had projects um, everywhere in Fiji, in Santa Lucia, in well many many places, and nowadays we do have um, some in some African countries and. Uh, Brazil as well, and um, yeah, we we work with partners all around the world, all around Europe, and um, in this sense, it's a very very interesting uh, place to work because we are always in contact with people from all, all around the world. So uh, we are here in the Faculty of Life Sciences, which is also something that's not so obvious if you study law. Normally, you go to you know something uh, if you go a little bit out of your field, you go to uh, maybe sociology or something like that. But here we are in the Faculty of Life Sciences because, well, this concept of sustainability is uh, here in the university was developed uh, as a link with uh, public health and um, health education. But of course, we know that uh, sustainability actually has to do with uh, pretty much everything from good governance to uh, nutrition to uh, conservation of the biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. And now, uh, in February this year, we created the Office of Sustainability Services here at our university. And I know that the Dutch universities are way, way ahead of everybody else. And uh, yeah, we are, we are gaining hearts and minds here at the university, trying to make our research and also um, uh, you know, teaching uh, more sustainable uh, with the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals, which you probably have heard of, the United Nations um, Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 goals uh, that can be measured in different objectives. And uh, yeah, this is what we work with, uh, basically, the SDGs. So what is it that I do, actually, my job? Uh, my title is project manager, but what I do is something, um, it's kind of a mix between project manager, research assistant, and grant proposal writer, because, well, we don't really get money from the university. Actually, this is the only department of the university that's completely uh, funded by third parties. So we do get projects from the ARD. I don't know if you, you know this uh, German uh, exchange service and uh, some German ministries and uh, the European Commission, and we develop our activities uh, within those, uh, those projects. Of course, uh, my, my boss was a full professor. He also lectures here at the public health uh, uh, master's program and bachelor's. And uh, yeah, we, everybody in the team does a little bit of the three. We write papers, uh, which is actually something I, I will Take as an example of uh, managing project uh, later on, and um, yeah, this is basically a mix of those three three careers, let's say that that we do. So one thing that uh, I thought it could be interesting uh, to share with you is, for example, my boss. He's a biologist. He's one of the lead authors of the IPCC. He's a professor, and between my colleagues, I have also biologists, engineers, and public health experts. So, you know, we are a very colorful <laughs> uh, group of people. I'm the only one with a legal background, which, uh, yeah, recently has been very useful because in our project, since we do uh, keep some websites and, uh, you know, we, if in, uh, we develop some applications sometimes, um, I, I need to have a look at the contracts and data protection and all of that and uh, copyright. So, you know, this is, uh, this is an interesting thing because uh, well, it's not really something I thought I would be working with, but it's quite useful, actually. And um, on a daily basis, I'm always in touch with the bureaucrats here at the university because, um, well, we receive money for our projects and we have to uh, present uh, all the receipts, let's say, uh, yeah, the accounting, I'm sorry, it's raining here. Can you, is it okay? The, can you hear me well? Okay. Yes, it's time. Um, yes, so uh, we are quite in 
always in touch with the bureaucracy of the university. For example, we we may have a project and our partner wants to know, oh, can I buy a tractor with this money? Because, well, we are building this, uh, you know, this big pool for keeping the fresh water and because there was a problem and we cannot do the plan the way it was before, we now need a tractor. And, you know, they ask us and we have to find out if with the grant money we can use, you know, to let's say have a tractor instead of something else. I'm just, you know, thinking uh, some absurd example. So, so you, you kind of have an idea. We also get media requests, uh, especially when the IPCC reports come out. Uh, my professor here, he's always, uh, you know, making some presentations about it. Um, we work together with professors all around the world, writing papers uh, and also some projects and grant proposals because uh, we normally have uh, quite a few partners. We, we don't really work alone on, on projects, which is also a, a very nice thing because you kind of get to know people, not just from working a few months with them, but one, two years, uh, up to four years, which is uh, the amount uh, of time we, we normally have for a project. Okay, so this is just so you have a little bit of an idea of what I do. Actually, I was going to put this slide in the end, but I thought, yeah, this could make you understand a little bit of, uh, yeah, some of comments I'm going to make when I when I tell you a little bit more about possible careers and uh, career paths that you can take uh, when you you know go a little bit out of the normal way that everybody. Uh, follows. So uh, what does a project manager do? Well, to put it in a very, very simple way, we have tasks that we have to accomplish with a budget uh, within a deadline. But what we really manage is not really a project, it's the people doing the tasks and spending the budget within this deadline. So the most important skills that you need to have in this uh, field of work is uh, communication and organization. You just have to, you know, just keep all the documents in a way that everybody knows what their job is, what they have to do, where you have to check with people, but you have to check with them in a way that they don't feel pressured and in a way that they know you, you're here to help them and you're not going to change something all of a sudden just, you know, to make their work more difficult. And sometimes you do have to do something that makes their work more difficult, but you know, just have to do it in a in a way that's like you know just comfortable and easy for everybody. So one example, something that we have every week. Uh, sometimes we write a paper with ten co-authors in eight different countries because well we we're talking about um, environmental impact all over the world, and sometimes we have uh, you know people from all different areas, and uh, yeah, we have to check. Okay, this person has to send. They are part until tomorrow, and they many times will not because of this and this and this. And you have to be in touch with them and have to know what's going on in their lives and you know talk a little bit to them. And okay, they're just finishing this other book, and then they will do this, but then they have to, you know, supervise four PhD students and you know just have to to find a way to, you know, to to be on their radar. Uh, another way, uh, yeah, this is a challenge because you don't know the people, you know, in, in person, uh, especially now I started working here two years ago, it was already the beginning of the pandemic. So, you know, I it can be quite uncomfortable writing an email to somebody, <laughs> you know, you were supposed to send me a paper um, 10 days ago, what happened? Uh, you know, if they don't really know you, you just have to make it in a nice way, but, you know, just not uh yeah not too nice so they know that they really need to to get their work done um so for example we also organize some uh online events with you know different teams in different countries different universities and uh for example our biggest project uh nowadays um it's a horizon 2020 2020 project that has 21 partners in 13 countries and it has a budget of 8.5 million euros that we the University of Hamburg received and we distributed to the partners and um, in this project uh, they are developing different applications bio for bio-based biodegradable plastics so there are some companies there are some universities um, there are some yeah some research institutions and 
they also have some struggles with, for example, uh, you know, signing NDAs. And sometimes there's uh, one partner in Finland, one in uh, France, and they are signing um, a contract together, for a non-disclosure agreement together. And they are not sure if this is uh, giving all the protections to the company. And then uh, somehow this ends up on my table, on my desk. And then, yeah, I just uh, have to navigate and, and, and tell them uh, what what our grant agreement says and you know really translate this 120 pages in terms that you know a scientist can understand uh you know somebody who's not a legal expert and who just wants to be uh, to get a test done so this is i think uh yeah one very interesting part of of what i do uh on a daily basis so uh after that i will Tell you about me because uh, uh, when I was talking to uh, Sandra, I said, okay, maybe I just want to tell them about how I end up here because I think this is sometimes the most difficult thing actually is like uh, imagining how your life is going to be in five years, 10 years, what you want to do, what you don't want to do. So, uh, well, I'll, I'll start. So I finished my bachelor's uh, in Brazil. I became a lawyer. I passed the bar exam. And uh, during my studies, I was uh, receiving a, a scholarship from the Ministry of Science and Technology because I was doing research on, um, it was like, uh, yeah, like uh, oil law, petroleum law in Brazil. And then uh, in 2009, I started working. So the last year of my Legal education was working and studying at the same time, both like studying full time and working full time. I don't know how. And then in 2010, I got a scholarship um, to come to Germany to study German for like six weeks because I already uh, I already spoke German because when I was 16, I decided, OK, I finished uh, my English course. I want to learn something difficult. So I went to learn. German. So I worked. Uh, after I finished my degree, I was a lawyer for two years. I was assistant the chief prosecutor of the state court of audit, which was also interesting because, yeah, he would deal with, you know, corruption cases and, you know, cases of uh, contracts that are not really uh, followed uh, that, you know, as city administrations would pay like in small towns. And then, yes, it was very interesting, it was a lot of work uh just incessant amount of work and then i took a break and did my my masters i was a um it was an erasmus uh degree a double degree in hamburg and rotterdam with a scholarship from a german institution the corner of the hour stiftung and then i started my phd which i haven't finished maybe not i'm still struggling with some acceptance issues on that uh, also, yeah, with a model scholarship. But if you really want to know the true story, um, yeah, when I finished my bachelor's, I applied for many things that did not work out. And then when I was working as a lawyer, still applying for many things that did not work out. And even during my PhD, I was applying for many things that did not work out. So I think it's, it's important to know, um, you know, if you are feeling like nothing is working out, well, I think that it should be like that, you know, you should try things yeah some things will not work out but that's how you know that you're trying something that you know is difficult or challenging you know eventually we will find something as our uh, as uh, Clementina said uh, you just need one positive result right uh, at the end you just need one thing to work out and yeah eventually something worked out but many, many things did not work out. I think uh, if the first thing had worked out, I would, I have no idea how it would be because I don't even remember <laughs> what the first thing that I tried was that did not work out. So I had this, I always had this interest in law of the sea, but I, it was not available in my university. You know, I wanted to study that, but it was just not possible. There was just one university, I think, in Brazil that had a program on all of the sea, but there was in Brazil, I could not go study there, like could not afford it. So when I was here in Europe, uh, yeah, I had a scholarship. I was, uh, you know, just 
looking around and you know just joining everything that I could that had to do with Love the Sea. So in 2015, I went to Spain and for a three day workshop um, a training school on Love the Sea. Then I I joined the um, Summer Academy of the International Foundation for the Love the Sea, like which was one month. It was here in Hamburg. And then I was an intern at the tribunal of the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea and went to a workshop in Shanghai uh, with a scholarship from the International Seabed Authority, which is a part of the United Nations um, system. So it's funny because the reason I got this into this workshop in Shanghai, which yeah, was with a scholarship, was because one of the people uh, organizing it in Shanghai had been in this uh, summer academy, uh, you know, uh, on the Love the Sea two years before, and we kept in, in touch. And you know, uh, she knew of my interests. And when she, uh, yeah, when they uh, advertised for this uh, workshop, uh, I, I saw her post on LinkedIn, I believe, and then I applied and I got in. And uh, there I met uh, one of the legal officers of the International Seabed Authority, and then I went uh, to do a consultancy there because I had sent one uh, feedback on their um, on the draft regulations that they have for um, exploitation of deep seabed minerals. And uh, I stayed there one month because uh, they do not really pay people, which is uh, the sad thing. Also, when I did my internship at, here in Hamburg at the tribunal, they did not pay me. Um, so I stayed one month, but I managed to get them to pay for my tickets, which were very expensive. So at the time I was back in Brazil and they paid for my tickets and I could stay there for one month. It was very nice because I got to see their, um, their yearly uh, assembly and also the legal, oh, the ex yeah, tech, legal and technical commission expert meeting, which is only it, it's close to the public, so it's something that nobody else, like, nobody can see. So I was there for two weeks, and uh, yeah, it was really nice. I got to see really interesting discussions uh, about this. But then um, it didn't really pan out to to bring me into any any career uh, path. But it's okay because then I came back to to Hamburg and then I worked as a temporary assistant at the tribunal. And uh, to be very honest, I started uh, as a temporary assistant there because the person who was working there, who I met, I knew from the summer academy, she was going on holidays for two weeks in December, and she could not find anybody to replace her. So she knew me. She knew I was. Uh, Living in Hamburg, I was looking for a job, and she asked me, "Well, uh, yeah, nobody wants to work for two weeks in December. Do you want to work for two weeks in December?" And I say, "Yes, I would say yes to any kind of work, of course." And then I worked there for two weeks, and then when they needed somebody again, they asked me, and then there there were uh, cases coming to the tribunal, and yeah, they already know me, so they kept calling me to go there for um two month three month uh contract and etc which it's obviously not something ideal if you want to really have a job because well you never know i was lucky that uh at that moment there were some cases happening you know which is actually a bad thing because uh, the cases uh, going there just meant that uh, i was bad things happening around the world so that's the the context of everything that uh, that happened then. And then I was, uh, as I said, always looking for a job. And then I worked as a trainee at Free Now. I don't know if you know, it's like Uber, but for like real taxis. And I was in the EU corporate uh, law uh, office. And it was really nice because, yeah, they, they had a very international team and I learned a lot. And I actually was a bit lucky that something really bad happened to somebody else because my supervisor at the time, she had uh, an accident, bouldering. So I actually had to do her job for like two months. And then, yeah, everybody was like really impressed that I could do all of it. Uh, yeah. Oh, but then it was when Corona happened and 
everybody who had uh, still like a temporary uh, contract was fired. So I was actually very lucky again because um, I had been approached by my boss, now a professor here, because we had written a paper together about deep sea bed mining. Because I, you know, I was always uh, trying to find ways to, you know, know people who could give me a job. So when he announced that he was writing a paper on something related to Amazon fires, I wrote to him and said, "Well, I from Brazil, and I'm a legal expert, and I have experience with environmental law. So if you want to add, you know." Um, something about the law there, uh, I can write this with you. But then that paper did not get made. But then when I met him, I, I talked about my previous experiences. And then he was very interested about this deep sea bed mining thing. And we wrote a paper about the uh, environmental uh, problems with deep sea bed mining with a lot of people from a lot of places. So uh, yeah, so he asked if I would be interested in coming here to work for four months because that's what he had like some uh, four months until the end of some project and I say yeah sure because I'm not gonna have a job in a month and um, yeah so I, I finished working for this other company on a Friday and Monday I started working here which was uh, yeah it was during the pandemic nobody was being hired it was like the beginning of the pandemic I was feeling so lucky just I couldn't believe it because I was looking at maybe going back home to my parents and yeah, just trying to, you know, apply for a job from there. But then I, out of nowhere, just somebody threw a job at me. I do not believe it. So um, if you want to know uh, my wisdom is, um, yeah, I mean, what I did was like talk to people, ask questions about their career, how they got there, why they got there, learn from them, Tell them what your interests are, what what the what interesting things you've done because I've I've done so many interesting things even as a student in Brazil, you know. Sandra knows I've done so many, you know. Yeah, I was always in the middle of the action, and yeah, it's it's nice because you really learn about yourself and what you want to do um, for your career. You should also ask for help. You know, I told all the people that I knew that I was looking for a job, and then people really helped me you know at some point uh, i even had people really trying to help me find a job didn't work out in the end for whatever reason but then you know they really tried and you know it, yeah it really makes a difference even if it doesn't work it's just okay somebody's really trying to you know to do this because they know i'm struggling and etc and blah 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 so that's that's also um uh, important you know just talk to people and yeah don't try to say oh yeah i'm doing great uh you know i have a, an amazing job and yeah if you if you know that you know you're going to be out of a job in a few months yeah just you know tell people yeah, it's, it's okay nobody yeah if they think bad of you because of that it's, it's on them like completely um and also to repeat uh the same advice that you already heard you should network, use LinkedIn, because then you keep in touch with the people you meet. You know, at some point, you never know when somebody's going to need somebody with the skills that you have. You know, and yeah, nowadays somebody may be working somewhere and they have a project approved and they need to find. That's actually what we have here. Like sometimes we have a project and we need somebody with this and this and this. And we are thinking, oh, my God, who do I know that can, can help? Sometimes we don't, you know, and then then that's how that's when we need to, to announce and look for somebody it takes so much time you know if people know you and know what you do what you're capable of it it's already going to help you and the the last thing yeah just be nice to people i know it can be hard sometimes you know <laughs> because sometimes people are not nice to you but you know just be nice and don't let that affect you and yeah you you will you know find the things that you want and the things that you need. Um, yeah, and this is something I, I really like. Uh, now I, I do have, uh, in the projects I have um, interns and I really try to, you know, teach them, well, you should not work too much. Do not work, uh, do not check your email at 10 p.m. Don't look at your emails on the weekend. And, you know, like this is the kind of thing that uh, somebody told me and I, I think it's important also that I tell to, 
you know, to the younger people that I work with, because um, it's really important, as uh, Peter said in, in the beginning, you should have, uh, you know, should be responsible for yourself and have a good uh, work-life balance. So, yeah, this is how you, you're going to be happy in your life, because, well, if you're just working and you're not happy, I don't really, I don't, I don't wish that for you. It's not, it doesn't make sense. And uh, this is it. Uh, my email is here. You can uh, yeah, just email me if you if you want. And um, yeah, I try to make this presentation a little bit uh, about things that you may not really hear from other people because I wish some people, some some person have told me some of the things I told you today. And um, yeah, it can it can be very very hard to decide what you want to do for your life, but nothing has to be forever. You know, uh, nobody has to be on the same job forever. You know, you can just you know quit and find something else. You can always um, you know try to learn something else, try to go somewhere else. So I think uh, yeah, if if you just First, think about what kind of life you want to have, and then then you think about what kind of job you're going to have. Because then then you're going to find you know something that you're you're going to be passionate about that you're gonna like doing every day. Because it is every day, really. Just you should you should do something nice. So yeah, this is it. Uh, yeah, thank you. And yeah, if you want to ask anything, just fire away. <laughs> Thank you very much, Cynthia, for this um, um yeah this um amazing uh, overview of um um yeah of the, your career path. It's very good to see that um um that it's uh, sometimes you just have the impression that things are very much a uh, straight line. Um, uh, when we look at LinkedIn, the career and everything, you think oh, and it's good to hear um um all um the challenges that we have. Um, in order to take to have these positions to um, and also for um, as a, a international uh, um, well student and now professional the change coming right from abroad to established um, there is also many of our students also wonder about this on the weather you know they will then have this uh, chance and um, also um, a financial aspects as you said okay how um there's a big discussion for instance on internships most of internships are not paid but also this also creates a kind of selection already beforehand because those that can afford then uh, stay for months without pay then can have these positions and while others not so all these issues that uh, um you have brought it's um very much uh uh, uh points um that yeah is under discussion on uh, for young people while establishing their career so thank you for bringing all that to put this uh, very, very honestly and uh, uh, very much appreciated so uh and um yeah uh, and also for all of you for bringing this balance i think this is so important to 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 just pay attention to that that yeah we do we are human beings and we have a life and it's not only uh, about work and uh, keep the boundaries and 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 doing something that you like right at the same time this is um yeah and also all of you brought networking and that's this, this event is exactly for this and these students are listening out there and and um uh, um yeah also listen now on youtube and send the questions this is exactly uh, the reason why we do this so that the students can uh, connect and learn from the experience and and, and um, yeah just raise the concerns that they might have so thank you very much um all of you for um, taking the time for sharing all this um uh, with our students um uh we do have uh, then i let then uh, mr lohange um to 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 should then open the microphone and speak because there is a question here but um yes mr lohange you can maybe address then the question 
Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, the presentations and everything indeed you share with the students because obviously uh, yeah, they, they, they try to find their way and, and as well a uh, mixing of course the skills they have, the nationality they have of course because quite often it is to change uh, something in the country where they come from as well that they study uh, environmental law and environmental affairs in general environmental economics. Um, so my question, I'm not an expert in environmental law, I'm, I teach with my colleague on energy sector, on the energy law side. Uh, my question is more indeed, as you have seen, uh, what is indeed your, your, your input or what, how actually you, you see the COP, uh, the, the conference of the party every year coming. Um, so uh, uh, do you, uh, let's say, uh, um, do you have your own agenda of research sometimes connected to the agenda of those COP, COP I mean, those uh, conference, or uh, do you try to go, or do you indeed uh, present what uh, yeah, you research, what your, you know, your state uh, is doing, or, or Greenpeace? So how does it work with uh, each of them, and, um, and if it is not far, of course, geographically uh, uh, to go, uh, do you try to go as well? Uh, yes, Peter, you can uh, already, yeah? Can I, can I answer? Yes. 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 Uh, it's, it's a really good question. Um, a few years ago, I was at uh, the, the COP24 in, in Katowice. Mm -hmm. And that was on, um, yeah, but that was in a different position. I, was, uh, I worked then at the, the, for the Climate Envoy and I was there for two weeks. And it, I really like, it is really used as, as, as for different aspects. On the one hand, of course, it's like uh, heads of state meeting, but also, very importantly, lots of uh, civil servants meet to, to work out all the details. Mm -hmm. And if they come to a conclusion and the head of state can say, well, we concluded this and that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's experts meetings, head of state meetings, but also lots of interest groups that come together to, um, to make deals. There, there's, uh, there are lots of different pavilions there from all different countries that say, like, well, we are doing these and these initiatives. Uh, learn more about what we are doing. Or uh, they say, like, let's, let's sign a, a certain agreement or a plastic pact or whatever. Uh, on those uh, on those uh, conferences, so uh, lots of things are going on, um, but it's really the the climate part of, uh, of 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 our ministry that works on that. I, I see the environment and environment and climate is in the Netherlands is something different uh, on the ministerial level. Mm -hmm. uh, so climate is more on CO two, while while environment is on on, yeah, on pollution to air, water, and soil of all the other different substances. Uh, so currently, I'm not not uh, participating anymore in COP, but I hope to do it again in the future because it's it's it gives lots of energy just to talk to so many different people that, that they yeah. take action on this uh, on this topic. Thank you. I will give, of course, the question as well to the to other speakers. But do you know if the Netherlands wants to organize one one day, or or it has been already the case? Or well, we have organized one, I think, twenty years ago or something. Okay. Like one of the first COPs was, was done in the Netherlands, and probably again someday, but it kind of switches per continent. So mm. I think we had one in Europe, uh, in Poland a few years ago, that was Katowice, then we organized it for two other uh, continents as well. So now I think we have to wait a little bit before it returns back to uh, to Europe. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Clementina? Uh, yeah, I actually had the opportunity to go to Glasgow last year with my university and with Dr. Voigt, but uh, I was writing, I was very much in depth of writing my thesis, so I unfortunately couldn't join. Uh, I don't think my colleagues went last year because we had a general election here, so I think they were very focused on, on the politics here and the campaigning around that. Uh, it's definitely more probable that I'm sure colleagues from maybe the international office or the UK office were probably there. I know that there was like a civil society area as well where people present what they're working on and sort of try and push their agendas. Um, what we do is we use any sort of happening like this to really push our agenda in the media. Um, and say, look, this and this is happening. We need more pressure on this. We need to phase, phase out fossil. We need to do all these things. So those types of, whether it's the IPCC reports being released, now we're, we have um, coming up the um, summary report um, in October, whether it's, um, yeah, those types of conferences, we try and do something related to that, whether it's pushing it in the media, whether it's, making an action, protesting for parliament, all sorts of things like that. So we definitely use any sort of opportunity that we have to sort of 
get ourselves out there and our messaging. Um, I guess it's more probable that we will go this year because it's a bit of a slower time in terms of politics here. But since it's in Egypt, I don't know if we'll be able to justify to fly there because we try and take trains most places. Um, so we'll see. Okay. <laughs> here it's very much like you're told one week, next week you're going somewhere mm. because something's happening. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to tell right now. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, Shincho? Yeah, normally my boss uh, goes to those conferences, uh, but uh, he goes alone because, well, he just goes to talk to so many people. It would be um, a bit impossible for anybody else here to follow him around. Uh, mm. But we might go to the Oceans Conference in Lisbon. Mm. Yeah, we, yeah. We get, yeah, if we get um, a spot, a talking spot, so... Otherwise, it would it would not be possible to to go okay. uh, to justify going there, not not working on the project for two days and just being there. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, a very, very last question, if you can answer very quickly, uh, um, uh, before indeed we, we, we end. Uh, why do you think uh, uh, those conferences are always, not always, but quite often commented as disappointing? So what is the main ingredient which prevents it? Uh, I mean, I think it, except the one in 2015, maybe. But uh, but why is the last one in Glasgow, indeed, in your opinion? Uh, Journalists uh, or some others said it was disappointing, in your opinion. Uh, Cynthia, maybe? Yeah. Uh, why I would think it was disappointing, the last one, well, I think there was not really um, a priority for many people. Uh, I think the environment is already not a priority mm -hmm. uh, for most governments, most of the time in, with the pandemic. And uh, I think it's just, you know, just a good, uh, it was a good excuse to, to not pay attention, you know, just to say you need more funds for something else. And uh, yeah, I think that's the, the bitter reality. Mm. But I just, yeah, I just really hope that we, we have uh, at least the, U uh, the Oceans Conference, which is, uh, you know, focusing on SDG 14, Life Below Water, uh, which is also uh, yeah, just an environmental um, aspect of, of yeah, they, yeah, the situation right now. I think yeah, it's really promising. I think that one is, is the one I'm yeah, more excited about uh, seeing what, what's going to happen. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Clementina, what do you think about, uh, yeah? Um, I think it's, yeah, Cynthia said, it's, just, it's not a priority for a lot of states. Um, where there's so many different things to consider within each individual um, state party, um, different capabilities, different responsibilities, um, so I think it's become a place where like people or politicians go to make nice promises and then say that they've done something and then end up not doing anything. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, as you say, it's, it, it, it hasn't been a, a prioritized and it's very difficult. It seems to sort of have how many state parties are 150 something to agree on something. Uh, so, so sort of life changing and so big. I think it's perhaps there's an issue with the mechanisms there, but um, yeah, I think that's part of part of the reason. Okay, thank you. And Peter? Well, I have a little bit of a different uh, opinion actually on this, mm -hmm. um, because every time there is a cop, it always gives you the feeling like uh, it's disappointing the results, but. Um, that's also because we have very high expectations and every time the report says uh, it's more urgent than the last time, so we say, well, let's now go and do our thing. But international conferences are always slow and the process takes long and it's, it's always like some kind of like a compromise. And that's just the nature of these conferences. They are always a compromise. It's never like we're going to take joint action. It's, it's just not the thing. I don't think that you can like a year or two years after a conference say it was successful. But sometimes in 10 years' time, you can say, looking back, like, actually some really good things were set in motion or like some initiatives really took off. So you kind of have to look at it in a broader perspective. 
And I think from Glasgow, the thing that we can take away is uh, no one denies anymore that climate change is a thing. And no one denies that we have to phase out fossil fuels. And it's like a narrative that you didn't have there five years ago. So in that perspective, you can say like we made some really big thinking steps. Of course, it's not enough and it's not concrete enough. And uh, governments are always lagging behind of what, what the series of the situation. But it does give us some perspective of like, but steps are being taken in, 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 the, in the bigger picture. And, and that gives me uh, some hope. Um, that that we uh, maybe in ten years time say oh actually Gaza was not as a big of a failure that we thought back in the days. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, I don't have any other question. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, for this, I would then give uh, um, uh, um, Peter you the floor to answer the question from Lorian because um, yeah you didn't have the chance. Yes, thank you. Um, I, let's see. Uh, I have to go back to take a look where what she wrote. Um, and she asks, I was wondering if you had a chance to follow up on all your projects A to Z, and especially reflecting on the and especially effect and the post complexion that draw conclusion on what worked and not worked. Well, I think that's a it's a good it's a good question because. Um, I try to follow up on all my uh, actions from A to Z, and it takes a lot of time and energy. And I'm aware that uh, if you say yes to a project, that's the easy part. The hard part is finishing it. Uh, and I'm now learning the hard way that, that, that I now work 70, 80 hours a week to kind of get all those things done. And I now kind of say, okay, I can't have anything extra on my plate because I first have to finish a few things to take new things on. So. Uh, I try to, uh, but it's also uh, quite quite difficult to, uh, to 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 uh, to 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 finish some of the things. But uh, for example, my youth council now kind of like it, I used to spend twenty hours a week on it, and now it only take three or four hours a week maximum. And they spend mostly on their own. And I can let it go and then give myself more time to do to do something else. Um, I think that's that's part of your question. Um, and and things that work or don't work. I think with lots of things. If you just carry on, it will work. With all, I, I, like during Corona times, I started lots of initiatives. I thought I'll start five, and then maybe one will be successful, and then it will be okay. And then all five became successful, and not just because I'm just like super smart or anything, but because I hang on every week. If you have a meeting on a, a certain topic, for example, with my forest initiative, just being there and saying, "Okay, we're going to take another small step." And even if like only two people show up next week, you still be there, and then next week you'll have three people, maybe like then there's five people, and then. Just going on and having like the discipline of continuing and being stably there and saying, "Oh, this is the plan. This is what we're going to do today. This is a small step in the right direction." And then at a certain point, it will be successful. But that means that you have to be like yeah, patient, determined, determined, and and then at some point it will work. I think that's that's that's, that's the second takeaway that I want to give from that. So, in uh, thank you very much, Peter. So we have two minutes left. Um, I would like to thank you all very much for taking the time uh, for being here with us today. And then actually I will let you close a few, any of, uh, for each of you, 30 seconds for a last piece of advice. Um, so then we close the session. Um, Clementine, would you like to have a few words? Uh, a piece of advice, um, just, Find something that you're interested in and try to make a path that leads you there. But as Cynthia also said, I'm sorry, Cynthia, I'm going to steal a bit. Nothing is forever. If you find something, you don't have to stay there. If you're unhappy, you can change. Just be open minded. Be open minded and know that it will be difficult at times, but you'll get there. Thank you. Cynthia? Yeah, I would say try to develop uh, your skills or some new skills uh, on the activities that you're uh, performing. So I think you can always grow, you can always learn new things. So this is, yeah, at least for me, I, it's something I like to do. So, you know, just try to find something that, that you can learn from uh, every experience of, or opportunity that you have. Thank you very much. And Peter? Yeah, I think doing something that you're passionate about, that's the most important thing. And if you're passionate and enthusiastic, then other people also be enthusiastic. And use that enthusiasm when you're writing an application letter. It's nothing duller than getting an application letter of someone who said like, I am good for this because I did this study, and then they talk about it. 
I always skip those application letters because they're not interesting. But if you have people say like, I want to work here because I want to learn this, I want to do this, or I completely disagree with your policy and that's why I want to change something and that's why I, why I apply, then you kind of think, oh, that one is interesting, that one has a passion, that one is driven. And that, that will really help you apply for things. And sometimes people will say that your idea is silly or that you haven't thought about it yet, but kind of stay true to yourself because you're a smart person and you have lived your life and uh, your opinion is reflected on, on, on your life experience and someone else's opinion on their life experience. And sometimes both things can be true. So uh, stay strong, do something that you're passionate about and you will, you will find your way. Thank you very much, uh, you all. Um, um, amazing uh, a panel. Um, really, really happy for this interaction uh, today. Um, and uh, wish you all the best uh, with the projects. And I really hope that uh, we meet very soon in another um, opportunity and also our students um, have the pleasure to have you in other events. So thank you very much. Have a very nice evening and um, see you soon. Bye bye. Thank you for the thank opportunity. So have a nice evening. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye.